Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the question seminar on differential algebra. Today, we are very happy to welcome Mercedes Perez Milan, who will give a talk about identifiability from a few variables in biochemical reaction networks. Thank you very much for giving this presentation. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on differential algebra, so I <laughs> I asked what would be okay to, to talk about here. And um, well, Daniel just um, thought that this uh, joint work with Gabriela Geronimo and Pablo Solonot that we did a few years ago was appropriate. So I hope you you, you like this result. Um, so um, what we did, I'll tell you what, what I will say uh, uh, I will start with enzymatic reactions and mass action kinetics which is what I'm comfortable with and then I'll tell you what we consider identifiability in this uh, context our approach um, what we mean by identifying from a few variables I'll tell you our first results and then our uh, somehow big result is that um, we applied our method to the signaling cascade, which is relevant in, in the biology literature. And uh, just to give you a spoiler, we can identify all the parameters from just one variable. But OK, let's move on. So um, I will talk about um, chemical reaction. So I will mainly focus on one type of reactions, which is uh, enzymatic reaction and um, I will say phosphorylation but you can think of any post-translational modification if you know what I'm talking about. So for instance here we have uh, two proteins a substrate S and an enzyme E and they bind and then the enzyme attaches a phosphate group to the substrate and then they unbind and the substrate is modified. For instance, it's phosphorylated. And once it has one phosphate group, I say that it, it, it used to be S0 without phosphate groups and now it's S1 because it has one phosphate group with the aid of the enzyme E. But these are just sketches and uh, we actually look at a uh, this graph, this directed graph, labeled directed graph, and from this graph we read the equations. So this graph says that E binds to a zero and gets transformed into U, which is an intermediate complex of both proteins bound together. And this reaction is reversible because they can unbind without any modification of the substrate but then the enzyme catalyzes the modification and they unbind and you have the enzyme and a product protein, which in this case would be the phosphorylated uh, protein. And from this graph, we read the equations and uh, we will model the dynamics with mass action kinetics. So the, for instance, the variation in time of this uh, protein U, which is the, the intermediate complex the, where E and S are bound, will change proportional to, for instance, if we consider the first reaction, it, it changes proportional to the concentration of both reactant uh, proteins in, or species, uh, E and S0. So, the term that contributes to the growth in this case of, of U is a, a proportionality constant, which is all, in fact called a reaction constant, A times the concentration of E and the concentration of a zero. And then um, in the other two reactions, you lose U and um, here the reaction constant is B and he's, here is C. So you lose U uh, proportional with proportionality constant B plus C times the, the amount of, of concentration of U. So you, you lose proportional to what you have. Um, what I would like to point out here is that these kind of equations are polynomial in the concentrations. 
of the species. So we have coefficients here, A and B plus C, and um, monomials in the concentrations. And um, with the same reasoning, you obtain the constant, I mean, the equations for all the species in this network, which are uh, the enzyme E, the substrate S0, then U, and also S1, okay? With the same uh, reasoning. So parameter identifiability addresses the problem of deciding whether all parameters in the model can be uniquely determined from observable data. So you know that, <laughs> but um, what we mean here is, okay, so we have, for instance, one equation. What I, I told you before, the derivative of u with respect to time, I would note that you thought. So um, if we would like to identify B, A, B, and C, I mean, if we wanted to get the, the actual values of A, B, and C, we couldn't from just this one equation because B and C are uh, in addition, so you will not get them separately. Uh, you There are infinitely many positive values of B and C, which give you the same result. So for instance, B2 and C5 or B5 and C2, you, you, you will have the same uh, function of, uh, of, of the species E, S0 and U. So B and C are not identifiable from U, or U prime, and uh, what we're saying is that the map that sends ABC, I mean the, the reaction constants to the polynomial coefficients, in this case A and B plus C, is not injective. If instead we consider the whole system of equations, I mean we have the four polynomials, then the map that sends ABC to all the coefficients is in fact injective. So we will be able to identify the three parameters from all the equations. But, okay, so this definition of identifiability is based on the definition that uh, George Creation and Cassian Pantia give in their joint work of 2007, where they say that if you have uh, differential equations as the one I, once I mentioned before, so they, they work with, uh, chemical reaction networks and the mass action kinetics. So you have uh, this x, x dot equal to a, a polynomial f that depends on some parameters or rate constants lambda and uh, the species x. So they, uh, they say that the system parameters are uniquely identifiable if this function, once specialized in lambda prime or lambda double prime is different if you consider different values of lambda prime and lambda double prime. So before I tell you our approach, let me tell you one more thing. So if we wanted to, to know the actual values of each parameter of each uh, reaction constant, one thing we could do is, for instance, um, substitute the values of the species maybe start with different initial conditions and assume that once you start with an initial condition, you know the value of the derivatives at time zero, okay? So assume that for uh, this initial condition, u equal to one, e as zero and as one equal to zero, you can somehow know that the first derivative of the species at time zero is, let's say, minus five, five, three, and two, respectively. So you have this um, system of equations where the unknowns are the parameters, and you can solve, in this case, for B and C. And if you pick a different initial state, let's say, zero, one, one, zero, and you could somehow get the value at time zero for the derivatives and let's say that it's four minus four minus four zero, then you can uh, substitute in this in your system and 
try to solve for uh, the unknowns. And here, uh, once you know, uh, well, in this case, you, you don't even have to know the values of B and C, and you get that the value of A is 4. So with these two substitutions, you get the, the, the three values that you wanted. But the problem here is that you have to be able to somehow know the values of the first derivative at time zero of all the chemical species. Or so maybe you cannot measure all of them. So some alternative would be to consider instead of all the first derivatives, maybe consider some variables and consider higher order derivatives. So we consider the, the Lie derivative. And um, so the second derivative of S1, let's consider the, the product, the one with the, the phosphate group here, the last protein and consider it's the first derivative and its second order derivative and replace the, the, the expression of the derivative with, with the corresponding polynomial from the system, from the mass action system. And instead of um, looking at the system of the four polynomial equations from mass action kinetics, we look at this system with two polynomials and its corresponding coefficients. And this map is injective. So we can um, recover the values from here. So for instance, assume that um, with this initial stage, you can measure the derivatives of uh, S1 and the second derivative of S1 at time zero. And you have, let's say two and minus 10. And for this other initial condition, you measure the derivatives and let's say they are zero and eight. So you solve for the unknowns for the parameters in, in this system and you get the values you wanted. So from this procedure, we give our concept of identifiability, which would be, okay, so you start with a mass action system, but instead of considering all the equations, you consider some variables, their derivatives, their higher order derivatives up to order n, capital N, uh, replacing the expressions when needed, I mean, from the original f, but anyway, so we consider up to order n from some species, and we say the system parameters are uniquely identifiable from those few species, x1, xk, if there exists a uh, capital N so that you consider their higher order derivatives. And once you specialize in lambda prime or lambda double prime, you get different uh, polynomial equations. Um, so in our previous example, A, B, and C are uniquely identifiable from S1 with capital N equal to two because we only need two derivatives. But for instance, if you consider this system where x1 transforms into x2 and then into x3, and you have two parameters, two rate constants a and b, and you just want to identify everything from x1, no matter how big the, the order of the of derivation you consider, you will always have minus a to one power times x1, and you will never get b. So you cannot identify b from x1. So we are assuming that we have this type of enzymatic reactions, a particular partition of the set of biochemical species. I will show you in a second what I mean by this. And uh, these assumptions, although they look quite restrictive, they uh, they are satisfied by, by many biochemical uh, reaction networks and many important biochemical reaction networks. For instance, the signaling cascade, uh, the ERC cascade, um, which is very important to, um, I mean, the, the cell receives information from the outside, from the cell membrane, and then you have this cascade that transmits the information and it goes into the nucleus and things happen such as, um, cell division, apoptosis, and many other things. So 
they're quite important. And um, so our first result is for if you have just one connected component, but let me say phosphorylation. So if, if, if E can phosphorylate as, as zero and put L phosphate groups with the same mechanism each time. So it, this, this is the distributive sequential phosphorylation uh, mechanism. So it means that E binds to a zero, gets intermediate complex, then they unbind and they bind again, and then E puts the second phosphate group and so on. So with this mechanism, you can consider just the last product that's SL with uh, its derivatives and um, you can identify all the parameters A1, B1, C1, up to AL, BL, CL from just the derivatives of SL up to order the maximum between 2 and 2L minus 1. How do we do this? Well, <laughs> we do it by hand. So we just look for specific monomials in each derivative and we look at their, co uh, their coefficients. And uh, for instance, in this table, I will show you. So from SL, we look at the monomial UL and the coefficient is CL. So then we identify CL. Then in the second order derivative, we look at the monomial, which is Y times uh, why uh, oh I should have changed this why is like e <laughs> so it's in e times s l minus one and the corresponding coefficient is c l times a l so if, as I already know who c l is I get the value of a l and what we do is we well, what happens is that we identify the parameters from the last one and back to the first one okay so we will go somehow backwards to identify the parameters and so on. So we look for certain monomials in, in each derivative and we solve for uh, the missing parameters, let's say. Okay, so with the same idea, we always, obviously we use induction here and with the same idea, we can prove the result for several connected components of the same shape. So for instance, you have different enzymes, different initial substrates, and they get, let's say, phosphorylated up to LK phosphate groups in, on each layer. And then you can identify all the parameters from just the, the last products on each layer and uh, up to certain um, order of derivation that is expressed here. And there's another mechanism which is important, which is, okay, you, you phosphorylate, but then you can dephosphorylate. So if you have two connected components of this shape, so th there's the enzyme E that phosphorylates and then the enzyme F that dephosphorylates, that goes from L to a zero, we can identify all the parameters in these two connected components just from one species, which is SL, the last product of, of, of the chain of reactions. And with the same idea, just looking at monomials in the, the system of polynomial equations. And our biggest result, so I, I, I have time, <laughs> I finished early, sorry, um, is related to this uh, cascade. So. I, this is a general cascade with uh, as many phosphorylations on each layer as you want and as many layers as you, as you want. The usual example is the ERC cascade, which has three layers and um, at most two phosphorylations on each layer. And as I told you before, it's it's important because it's the, mechan the mechanism that, that transmits information is that just add a signal in this case. So from the, the outside to the cell nucleus. And what we got here in this mechanism is that, and for, for this network, is that assume you have different phosphatases on each layer. Uh, let me tell you what's happening here. So what's happening here is that the substrate 
S0 from the first layer, that's S10, gets phosphorylated up to L1 phosphate groups. And then it, it can be dephosphorylated by F1, but then it goes to the layer um, below and it acts as an enzyme on this layer. So instead of having E, you have S1L1 as an enzyme here. It gets dephosphorylated by some two, and then this last product goes and acts as an enzyme on the layer below and so on. Okay, that's that's why it's called a cascade. So in this mechanism, if we assume that we have different phosphates, uh, phosphatases, so different different Fs on each layer, all the constants in the whole cascade, as big as you want, <laughs> as many layers as you want, as long as you want, can be identified by just one species, which is the last product in the last layer. <laughs> and uh, the order of the derivatives is bound by this number here, which is related to the length of all the, I mean, the, the number of layers and the length of each layer. The idea of the proof is just the same. So we look at the derivatives of Sn, Ln. They have this shape. And you consider here the intermediate complexes and the derivatives. You look for monomials in here. We have this kind of table. <laughs> I, I don't expect you to read this at this moment, but, but we use induction. So we, we start solving. So the way we solve for the, the coefficients, it's we move uh, backwards and then upwards. Okay. And finally, we tested a result with some experiments some other people did many years ago. <laughs> So from this uh, Kiao and other collaborators from 2007, and they have this two layer cascade. We used their table with their constants and we used um, some initial conditions as I told, as I showed you before. So with these initial conditions, we got the values of the derivatives by replacing uh, with the constants they have and we put those values of the derivatives in the system and we could recover at the time we did this with maple, we could recover all the right constants by um, substituting in these points. Then uh, I gave a course uh, for undergrads and uh, during the pandemic, so I had to adapt the code to open source um, software so i used python uh for for this for instance for this small network um let me order the variable so we have a zero as the first variable uh, then as one then e and finally u so we're considering the last product so uh, i will consider the first and the second derivative of x2 which is as concentration of s1 as we did before, I'm just changing the notation. So I use the same um, initial points that I used before with the same values for the derivatives as I told you before. And I can solve for um, the values. And here you have, for instance, A, B, and C are 4, 3, 2. Here's the code. So uh, I, this has to be improved. And I, I would also like to know why uh, or how to uh, choose the points because these points work, but I don't know exactly why I should pick uh, those points to identify the, the parameters, but they work. Uh, I computed, uh, this is a function that has to be improved to compute the d derivative of each variable and then i chose the second variable x2 up to order two for uh, the, the derivatives and then i evaluated i sub substituted uh, it's python python so it's the, the first coordinate is zero and then the second one is one so the first derivative 
gets um, substituted with B1, which is 0, 0, 0, 1, and then the second order derivative uh, is substituted in P1 and P2, where the values were 2, minus 10, and 8. And I asked Python to solve the system, and let me show you that since we have time. Uh, so it's, where is it? <laughs> Ah, uh, sorry. No, not here. Not this one. Let me, let me, let me share. No, I cannot. Let me show here. Okay. Um, so now I, I ran the code I showed you before. It's just, it has to be improved, of course. <laughs> it was just for a course. And uh, finally, the output is the values of A, B, and C, which are where four, three, and two. So um, that's the, the aim here. Somehow we would really like to um, get the sorry um the values the the actual values of the um, of the rate constants so we we want to know if the the network or any other chemical reaction network is identifiable and then being able to recover the actual values of rate constants so um sorry this it's early but this is what i wanted to tell you so here are some references and uh, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Are there questions? Uh, please um, just unmute yourself or write in the chat. Um, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, could you say again uh, how you find the values of derivatives? The values of the derivatives? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no. But you mean the numbers? Yes. Or the, the no. Yeah. Uh, so for instance, the implication there in the middle. Like oh, the implication here is assume you can measure that. So uh, in, in, in this case of, of Kiao, yes. we had the right constants from their table. We just computed them because you you symbolically compute the the lead derivative and we replace with the with the corresponding values of the their table and you get them but how you obtain that biologically that's a good question a very good question because we are assuming you can measure without noise and how to get the fifth derivative i have no idea <laughs> but assume you could sure okay. yes and this would follow up uh, so generally you're finding the values of those derivatives just through the experiment. Sorry? So you're generally finding those values through the experiment, but not really from math. Exactly. It's from the experiment, but, but is it realistic? I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I actually had, had a similar question. Um, um, so in your code at the end, um, yes. could you indicate where the input to that program is like someone is using your code now and what would i have to and at which places would i have to specify um, let's say values uh, huh. like you so, like f1 up to f4 i guess is what you like yes yeah, uh, so this is mass action okay so yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess it it has to be implemented somewhere. Had to 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 come from the <laughs> the, the directed graph, and you get the equations. Okay. Uh, yes, this has to be uh, improved for a, a generic case. And then the 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 good question here, because I don't know, maybe if if anyone knows and can tell me, um, this uh, uh, interpolation theory <laughs> that is behind these uh, things where you pick some points which points to pick i don't know <laughs> they worked 
but I would really like to have some theory behind this, not just the heuristics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the second components here, zero, 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 one, etc. these are somehow chosen. And then, is that correct? Yeah. S sorry, here? And, and other other possibilities, there are other possibilities maybe for... for definitely, your, your, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And then, for example, the next block of lines, you you have like a minus 2, plus 10, minus 8. Oh, here. This, oh, this is because, yeah, so because uh, here in this example, assume you have 2, minus 10, 0, because this, this equation is uh, <laughs> it's uh, redundant. And then 8... So what I did is I substituted in the, the first derivative with the first point, the second derivative with the first point, and the second derivative with the second point, with the corresponding values 2, minus 10 and 8. This code should be improved, definitely. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to, to show you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's my, my question is not about the code in particular. It's, it's about what would be the input. And here, like the here. values minus yes. 2 plus 10 minus 8, it would, could potentially be something you observed in an experiment, yeah? Exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Are there other questions? There's something in the chat. Can you see the chat? Ah. No, oh, I can read it. Should. So a practical no, problem. Me? William Sid asks a practical problem that follows Alexei's question is how are the products of a reaction separated so that the rates, constant expressions, can be estimated for each component? Ah. Yes. So that would be this table here. It was intuition. <laughs> so how to pick the correct monomial? Maybe you're, ask, you're asking that. How to pick the correct monomial to find the right coefficient and uh, start separating the values. I mean, just to identify new uh, parameters from each monomial on each derivative. That's something we expected and we could prove it. <laughs> No, uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, so the question actually is, um, in a practical sense, so you, you, you have done these reactions, and then you have in this chamber all sorts of these products, all right? I mean, products in, in the double sense, um, what, what, what comes out of the reactions, and then the uh, monomials that represent the components. So how do you separate them? I mean, physically, how do you separate them so that you can actually measure the, the constants. Ah, to measure the to measure the constants, I have no idea. Here we're trying to estimate, but you mean how to to biologically ex extract yeah, the right. value Actually, of this output? I don't know, but um, but somehow I mean, the out. Yeah, sorry. No, I mean in any particular system that you are working on. Uh, of course, this is all theory, but. How can it be applied, actually? Yeah, well, that's what we want. <laughs> we, we we talked to some biologists, but then the pandemics <laughs> stopped everything. But um, yeah, somehow they they say they can measure this uh, these proteins because that's a phosphorylated protein that they, that they they look for somehow. So they they told us that they would be able to measure these proteins, but somehow the intermediate complexes aren't stable, so you cannot measure their concentrations with them. Yeah. Well, but, 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 you see, but you see the 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 monomials that you pick out, right? They are not the, physical products. You mean these monomials? They are, they are they are just concentrations of different things. So how, ah. do, how do you actually do anything about it? Yes, but that's why, because what we need the interpolation uh, in order to get the, I mean, this this proves, this way we prove that the, the, the map, I don't know if I'm answering what you're asking, but this, this way we prove that the map is injective, okay? But I'm interested in getting the actual values of, of the constants and, and that's why I need some interpolation result that I couldn't find anywhere. <laughs> so, 
So we just give a new heuristics. Um, but here in this case, you, you don't need to, to, I mean, here in this table, we're just proving an injectivity. So you don't need any values. You just, yes, you just oh, want okay. to. The, the thing is that these monomials that you use mm -hmm. are not physically represented by anything. Yes. Yes, but 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 we're just looking at formal systems. No, I understand. I understand yeah. the theory. Yes. Okay. okay. But how can you apply the theory if you if these monomials that you pick are not really any physical things that you could uh, identify with the properties or or something so that you can actually measure the constants? No, no, no. That that. I, I guess I have the same question. How to, how to uh, specialize? I mean, what 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 we're saying here is that if you change the initial condition, you will somehow change the monomial so that you can get the monomial you want. No, no, I don't. Or, I have no doubt that you can find these monomials or pick the ones that that will work out the mathematics, but physically, physically, when you physically, so to how to how you can start with, by different initial conditions you mean no it's not it has nothing to do with initial conditions. so so you take a monomial let's say you know a product of three things uml and pm are on the slide mm -hmm. on the top one well mm -hmm. what is it i mean how do, what does the coefficient the constant attached Let to me... it physically mean so you can no. actually measure it no, but I don't. I don't. I don't know if we're trying you can to do measure. The, you can do the arithmetic. Uh, William, I think. <clears throat> uh, so I think we're just discussing uh, this formal math that is used to test identifiability. So the definition right. there was quite uh, natural, right? So different values will give yeah. you different data, uh, right. and uh, the rest of the stuff that is there, you can view this as sort of a dark matter. Uh, that is it cannot be measured, cannot be accessed. And we're just uh, trying to see which part of this dark matter can be estimated from just uh, those measurements of one thing. Uh, and to uh, estimate it in the sense that at least, uh, you know, possibilities so that like two different values give you, uh, cannot give you the same result. So that's that's all that's going on. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a purely math, math thing uh uh with a natural definition i i would say so like no, I, I, I understand I, I, that I really uh, uh, yeah in fact uh you know the Sadis gave a very very clear talk uh you know so we understand the mathematics no problem so but the thing is i'm really uh, not understanding how how it is practically usable these results well, uh, yeah. so this tells you that whether in, in practice it's possible to infer the parameter values or not. So parameter values have some meaning. No, no, no. Parameter, the original ABC, yes, they have yes. meaning. But yes, that's, that's about to, that. But when you try to calculate these numbers in sequence, all right, you have to measure the constants of all the monomials in the subsequent equations. No, how Not, do you no. no, I think no. I think your point. No, you can express them through the last thing. So the identifiability, another, uh, you know, another approach you can do it algebraically. If there's a formula in the measured quantity and its derivatives that uh, expresses your parameter. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. those, so those, ex those are just mathematics and not uh, any, uh, not any experimental things. You're saying no. No, it's well. You can view this maybe. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, no, yes. Also, we would we would like to do this experimentally. Uh, we couldn't get people to do this uh, actually, but um, yeah. But but the experiments. The only problem here for the experiments is to compute the higher order derivatives of the of the product here. That's the biggest problem, because yes. So um, no, but, you don't. But, but the you computation. Don't need to... Sorry, but the computation yes. is not. Not anything difficult. I mean, we have all these symbolic computations and all that to do that. 
Oh yes, but um, but you need we need the output. I mean, we need to know uh, at time zero the the fifth derivative is fine. <laughs> I don't know what, <laughs> how to measure that. I don't know if they use find a difference or, or I mean approximations to the to to the higher order of the derivatives. I mean the the how to measure the the, the rate of change, right? From okay. from the, the experiments. That's a problem. I don't know how they okay. do it. Right. No. The mathematics should work. Okay, there's another question in the chat um, by John Mahay. Um, he writes, I'm curious which chemicals or actual chemical reactions did Kiao 2007 use in their research? Um, I guess it's, I guess it's, um, it's phosphorylation because it, it's basically th these cascades come from phosphorylation reactions. I cannot exactly remember now if it was an, an, an arc cascade or something similar. Sorry, yeah. Okay, I hope this answers the question. Are there other questions? Yeah. Okay, John writes, thank you. It seems to be okay. If there are no other questions, then we thank Mercedes again for this very nice talk. And um, see you all next week again. Have a good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.